Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's program. I'm Julie Lithcott Hames, as Marissa said, author of Real American and How to Raise an Adult. And tonight, it is my pleasure to be here in conversation with Sally Cohn. Sally comes from a life of activism and organizing, and she's now a political commentator, currently on CNN and formerly on Fox, which we are gonna, <laughs> we are gonna talk about that. She's a columnist, the host of the podcast State of Resistance, and most importantly, for our present purposes, author of a brand new wonderful book, The Opposite of Hate, a field guide to repairing our humanity. Quite a tall order. Sally's book focuses on the hate that often pervades our communities and conversations, and most importantly, on what we can do to stop it. I'm really excited oh to dig in to this conversation, not just with Sally, but with all of you. So Sally, Sorry, welcome. Sally just realized <laughs> what time it is on the East Coast. She said earlier it's her bedtime, right? Welcome so to the Bay. Hi, hi everyone. everyone. Okay, this so panel brought to you by <laughs> Coca-Cola. Oh, I Go don't know ahead, if you can sister. say that actually, because we're on TV and radio, can't. and now so we've sorry. just made it's a product really. placement. It was just a joke. It's just I'm some so sorry. generic cola. Um, you are here in the Bay. You are in the city by the Bay. You are in the 415. Don't make me sing. Who's here from the 415? She was actually singing in the green room. 415, raise your hand or shout, make noise, because this is radio. <laughs> and 510. <laughs> oh, that's the East Bay. Right, oh, I know. If you I will, know. the Brooklyn of the Bay Area. <laughs> That's so true. Oh no, now Berkeley's like, yeah. Oakland's like, no, we are not Brooklyn. I get you. Right. All right, 408. <laughs> okay, uh, 650. That's where I'm from. Okay, is anyone from Marin? I don't even know your area code. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and the answer is no, so it's fine. Okay, so. Wow, I um, never even, I really never thought of it as breaking it down by area codes. So that's because we can't necessarily do that. In New York? Now, well, also the cell phones really screw it up. Anyway, go on. That is true. So there, there are plenty of things we can do here that you can't do in New York. And. Um, why don't we just talk about so that? So once again, we will <laughs> <laughs> welcome it's you. It's going to be a conversation to the San Francisco Bay Area. Geographic resentment <laughs> is what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Well, you know, you talk about hate, and we have this in-group, out-group, and I'm setting us up as members of the in-group of the San Francisco <laughs> Bay Area right now. That was a little bit of, you yeah. know, planting a seed in I the know. audience. I know. We'll come back to it. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of this conversation, I'll know how to talk to my relatives at Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that's something we probably all have in common, regardless of really every other aspect of our identity. We have people yeah. in our lives. We find uh, it really difficult to reach across the table and have a conversation with. And I make that point to say that this difficulty of hate is personal mm -hmm. and it is communal and societal and political. There are so many different layers and levels to it, and I hope we'll get a chance to touch on various bits. It's but always that, by the way. It's always, like, in, in audiences like this, it's always relatives at Thanksgiving, and <laughs> it's 80% of the time uncles, but go on. Yeah, fine. It's no. always people like, my uncle like at Thanksgiving. I, I just, and right. yet again, because we're on TV and radio, not my uncle. That's not what I <laughs> certainly was trying to convey. Okay. <coughs> All right. So easy first question. Um, why'd you write this book? Um, first of all, I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm honored to be in the Commonwealth Club. This is like, you know, this whole moment is a dream come true. Uh, so thank you. We're glad to have you. Um, uh, I, you know, I knew intellectually, I think, uh, that we had a problem with hate, right? And I was feeling it certainly uh, around us. I think certainly now in this moment, we can feel like, you know, there's just this sort of acrimony, intensity, um, cruelty, meanness, sort of politics of personal destruction, sort of all of that. And I'll be honest, I don't, I don't actually think it's the worst it's ever been. Mm. I think we as a country were founded on hate. We'll get right? to that. Mm -hmm. we, we should get to that. But that it, so when we have had mm -hmm. worse moments than deeply now. worse moments of hate in our history. And yet at the same time, it, there's an intensity and a sort of kind of surround sound of hate right now, and the fact that we're all kind of participating in it and implicated in it because of mm. the immediacy of media and social media, mm. that I don't think it's the worst it's ever been. It doesn't have to be the worst it's ever been for it to be bad enough, we have to do something about it. For me, what this has been a couple year journey for me, mm -hmm. several year journey for me, and when it started was, 
you know, as you mentioned, I began my career as a community organizer. Right. So I'd go around the country and I would, uh, you know, visit small towns and cities and communities who were trying to make changes on school policy and immigration reform and health care and criminal justice reform and help them do what they wanted to do and connect and win. And I fell into the media. That's another story. We could get into that. But I fell into the media and ended up, as happens, being a lefty lesbian on Fox News. <coughs> and That's a pretty unique role. Um, I hope I didn't freak anyone out here in San Francisco. I know y'all <laughs> get super freaked out by that whole lefty part. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but, uh, and so when I went into Fox, you know, I had this idea that they had hateful views, supported hateful things, the people on air, the people behind the scenes, the people watching at home. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just that. I thought they would be 100% totally and completely hateful. They would just be mean to me. They would be overtly homophobic, just nasty. And that's just th in an unqual- like I didn't even think about it. I just assumed that would be the case. And you did this, then why? Why did I do that? If you thought it was going to Oh, happen. if I thought I would do it. Well, that's a, that, that is an interesting question um, because, look, why do people rob banks? Right? Because it's where the money is? To get the money. Right. Okay, so yeah, you're going to get the money. The money, money so okay. why? But if, if your goal, if your job, I mean, there's a whole question about the shift from organizing to media and why I made that. And, but um, if your goal is to change hearts and minds, if you believe that an essential part of social change if, you if you're working for a social change and you believe an essential part of social change is not just changing institutions and systems and structures and policies, but also changing the hearts and minds of people, mm -hmm. then one of the things you do is go to where the most number of people are. Mm. And at the time, That's at least in 2011, were. 2012, there were more Democrats watching Fox News than CNN and MSNBC combined. Democrats. Whoa. Yeah. So, and don't get me wrong, like I called, I literally called on my friends who were the ones organizing the campaigns to destroy Fox News. Yeah. Those were my friends. Yeah. Still are. And I was like, hey, y'all, <laughs> how do you feel, like, write and work this through and was accountable to them. And, and so, but when I went in, mm -hmm. I had this idea that they would just be completely, totalistically hateful. And two things happened. One, they weren't. So I'm not saying I didn't think they, their views were hateful. A lot of the things they said and did and supported were still hateful believed it then, still believe it now. But I, we found areas of nuance. We found areas of connection. And they were nice. And I, maybe I shouldn't have been so thrown by that, but I really was. They would care about my family and my career and care about me as a person and were just nice. Mm. And the thing I realized <laughs> was that I hated them. Like, I hated them. Yeah. I had all these preconceived notions and stereotypes and generalizations that I had applied. And all of a sudden I realized like, oh, okay. And it just, it suddenly became a lot more complicated to me. And I wanted to interrogate. Here I was thinking of myself as a pretty kind person who was against them and their hate. Yes. And when I saw it in myself, it scared me. And I wanted to understand it and do something about it. Beautiful. So as you know, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we possess no hate. Of course we not. We are the most open-minded people, really, in the country and probably on the planet. We're, yes, we're and only you hateful. possess no superiority either. Right, and yes. we're only, that too, and we're only hateful of the intolerant, who we despise, <laughs> right? So, um, so here you are with the Fox Newsians, discovering you hate them as much as you knew they hated you, and yet there was commonality. You were human beings who could be kind to one another. Um, and you began to forge connections with people like Sean Hannity, Hannity, sorry, <laughs> so much so that he wrote a blurb for the back of your book. So you really did cross over. I mean, you, you became somebody. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> Go on. You discovered um, a commonality that um, maybe the rest of us thought was not possible, um, that it is possible to have conversations across the aisle, if you will and to discover that there, whatever hate we fear is lurking in them is also lurking in us is a really big aha moment, right? So I think an, a central point of your book is that hate is innate, that we are all, to a person, quite capable of hate, right? And I think if there's anybody who doesn't believe that, you know, um, go look in the mirror and interrogate yourself. 
um, and discover the truth of, of what Sally has written, that, that hate is an aid, it is in all of us. But you, all, you go on to say, I think, that you know, hate is hate is hate. There are all kinds of hate, there are levels of hate. And you sort of end up equating um, the hate that we might have on the left, that you might have in your being, for those on the right, with the hate they have toward you. And I found myself asking, really? You know, because when we look at that spectrum from right to left, you know, there's Republican and Democrat, but over, way over here on the right is white supremacy. And that hate has at its root an ideology of we will kill the Jews and we will kill the blacks. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the extreme on the left, are we really, do we have an equivalent hate on the left? Yeah, I should, so first of all, uh, apologies if that conclusion seems to be drawn by my book, because actually I don't believe that at all. I don't think there's an equivalence. I do think that is one side right is, then? one. I think one side is worse than the other, the okay. right. Um, <laughs> I mean, Does right, like they actively that? practice, I have told him, uh, they, have actively, they actively practice the politics of hate, right? We can yeah. just, let's pick one example. Uh, modern American politics, the policy, the practice, the you know uh, strategy of dog whistle racism, right? So politicians using, very consciously using coded language that comes with it a carefully calculated plausible deniability. No, 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 I'm not really race baiting and inciting right. racial hatred and, and resentment, but like, like the dog whistle, people know, they know it when they hear it. Exactly. Now, in modern, in the last 60 years, that has, yes, Democrats have done it. Bill Clinton yes. definitely did it, mm -hmm. right? And, and Hillary, right, super predators, that was. And it has been an explicit strategy primarily of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And not like, this isn't a conspiracy theory, like Richard Nixon said it. what he was doing. He was very clear, I'm not gonna repeat his words, but he was very clear like, yeah. can't say this and that and that, right. cause, right. but We're I can call it law say and law and order. order and people know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And when Reagan talked about welfare queens, mm -hmm. he didn't, but he, did, he never mentioned the race of the fictional welfare queen he was attacking, right. he just mentioned that she lived in the south side of Chicago so people knew. Right. And the message was that she was getting something that you good hardworking people deserve and he never had to mention race but people knew. Right. And Donald Trump took a dog whistle and turn it into a blowhorn. Yes. And that is that side, right? Yeah. So I don't think, and, and then of course, and that's just, that's like mainstream Republican Party. We're not even talking about, right. you know, right-wing hate groups and the alt-right and neo-Nazis. Right. So I do not think yeah. both sides are equal. However, at the same time, I also think that we tend to have a they started it philosophy of hate. That's true. Where, as you said, so we our use hate, hate is justified. Correct, right. in right? response to what they started. So I've been in like dinner party after dinner party. Again, I'm sure in San Francisco, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but I've been in these dinner parties where with, since 2016 with my liberal bubble friends, and we all sit around and they're, you know, we're all doing it. And they're saying, God, those Trump supporters, they are so, you know, Islamophobic and anti-immigrant and racist, and they are so hateful and I hate them. Now, for me, there's two pieces to this. There's a moral dimension and a pragmatic dimension. We can unpack it. But to start with the moral, if I am, this is where I don't think that, that I put the burden on the left more in a way, even though it, I don't think historically it's our fault, which is to say, we are supposedly the ones, I'll speak for myself, I am a lefty. Because I believe, and I say I believe, in the equal dignity and humanity of all people. The equal dignity and humanity of all people. And so the question then becomes, do I really mean all people? Do I even mean people who don't agree with me? Do I even mean people who deny my humanity and my equality? And I think that is, if we're really living our principles and our vision for the world, that means that it's the left that should shoulder more of that moral burden. I really struggle with that because I feel that to sit down with people who deny my humanity, while it may serve this purpose of opening a door or it might be received as the extension of an olive branch, I feel to some degree, Sally, that I am yielding self-respect by deigning to sit with somebody who regards me as less human. 
How have you contended with that personally? How have you, first of all, have you felt what I have just described? Um, the sort of abdication of the obligation to care about self and care for self mm -hmm. in order to try to be in dialogue with people who hate us? How have you contended with that? So, um, yes, let me, let me say a couple things. First of all, this is not a mandate by any stretch of the imagination. So, look, to me, when you encounter hate, you have three choices. One is, first, do no harm, right? Like, for your sense of security and sanity, I am not going to engage. I am going to ignore, or if it's in a family, I'm gonna say, look, we're not going there. Let's talk about movies, let's talk about sports. We're not doing this. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna do this, or to disengage. That is a sane, and, and can be a very sane and smart choice. Mm -hmm. The second choice is to f feed hate with hate. Yes. So to respond, hate with more hate. And obviously, I don't like that choice. I do not think that the answer to hate is more hate, that the answer to injustice is more injustice, the answer to cruelty is more cruelty. So option three then is to engage, and to engage in ways that are kind, compassionate, constructive. Uh, at one of my book events uh, a few nights ago. I'm sorry, I gotta say something. Go ahead. I'm feeling like you're expressing, I'm not religious, but I'm yeah. about to say like, you yeah. sound like Jesus. <laughs> yet there's this irony that- That's literally the preaching. first time anyone has right. ever said <laughs> that to me, <laughs> Julie. But the point is like, you know, Jeez, respond to hate with love is what you're saying. And the irony is you're asking us to do that with a group of people who go around talking about Jesus as being often the foundation and formulation for who they are and what they do. There's a lot of irony in our world today. <laughs> Amen. To say the least, irony, Amen. hypocrisy, hypocrisy, irony. Um, at, at one of my book events a few nights ago, Maya Wiley, who is, so I think, one of the, that was a friend and also one of the smartest thinkers on issues of race and justice, uh, and especially around implicit bias, um, she said that compassion isn't the same thing as agreement. Hmm. So being compassionate towards someone else, their pain, their experience, their perspective, their reality, their, doesn't mean agreeing with it, that's not the same thing. So, um, uh, oh, hello, Ready. question Questions cards, the audience. right? Excellent. So now that's my, the, so the, but it's a, it's a choice, right? Now, let me give an example, Yeah. right? So go back to Sean Hannity. I uh, was gonna go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, sh okay, so once upon a time, I was on Sean Hannity's radio show, again, as one does. And this was pre-marriage equality I decision. His name Hi, I'm so sorry. In the TV lineup you know. when I travel and I'm in a hotel and I see like, the Hannity Report or the Hannity Show or whatever, I just shudder. I think like, I can't go there because I know within moments he's gonna say something that yeah. makes me feel offended I know. to exist. So let me say two things. I'm gonna tell you this story um, and keep drinking my Coke because it's like I can only hold two thoughts right now. No, uh, I'm gonna say that you asked if I'm self-deprecating always. Uh, first of all, it took me a while when I started going on Fox to realize that the point of being there wasn't to talk to Sean Hannity, mm. right? I was never gonna change his mind. Okay. The point was to talk to the people at home, the audience at home, the people who, in fact, are not as firm and formed in their views, mm. who sometimes go, I don't know about that, or right, or right, so number one. Number two, that being said, mm -hmm. I don't know if folks remember, in 2012, uh, and like, when I see Sean, we go at it. It's not, there's nothing in my book that says, let go of your strongly held beliefs or convictions, mm. right? Let's ignore our differences and disagreements. I think our differences and disagreements are important. Mm -hmm. Important to us as a species, important to us as a country. When, does anybody remember in 2012, after Barack Obama was reelected, Sean Hannity went on air and said that he supports a path to citizenship and that immigrants who are here are hardworking, part of this country and deserve to stay. Now, I will tell you, I would give my left arm for him to still be fighting for that sure. and to stand up for that. That would make more of a difference. Absolutely in just immigration policy in this country yeah. than anything I could ever do. So like I also, Black, I don't think Glenn Beck, Glenn Beck is view, viewpoint on black people. Yes, yeah. I don't think, I don't think anyone's a lost cause. Now, so Hannity, so I'm on his radio show once and he, um, we're debating gay marriage before it was the law of the land. And he says something about, well, but Sally, you have to admit that a mother and a father are the best situation for a child. That's my best Hannity impersonation right there. <laughs> You're welcome. And, uh, and so I stop and I say, Sean, are you suggesting that your family is superior to my family? Now in that moment, let's be clear, I could have said, Sean
Sean, you homophobic, hateful asshole. Yes. I could have, right? I could have. Nobody would have, right? It would have been justified. It would have been right. I could have. for ratings. It would have been good. Let's come back to that because it would have. But instead I said, Sean, Hmm. I asked a clarifying question and yeah. gave him the opportunity to be better. And I said, is that what you're saying? And he said, oh, but, no, I, I'm not saying, you know, I don't think that. Don't take it personal. And I said, but I, I do take it personal. How can I Sean, not take it How personal? can I not? So fast forward, the next day, he comes and finds me in makeup at Fox News, and he apologizes. And he said, I had no idea you were gay. And I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And I had no idea you were an asshole. I actually, I actually took a poll in Fox Makeup. I was like, hey, everybody, <laughs> show of hands. Who knew I was gay? <laughs> I mean, they're all like, right? Well, it was the makeup room. Right? Anyway. <laughs> he apologized, right? He told me privately some of his more nuanced views and then asked about my family. We exchanged pictures, and listen, Brian Stevenson, who wrote the book, Just Mercy, Just Mercy, who just opened an amazing new museum, his incredible museum, uh, which is in important because we as a country tend to push away honest discussions things. and reality about our brutal and ugly, hateful history. Um, so uh, Brian Stevenson was one of my professors, and he so one of the lucky. I can't even tell you. Oh my gosh! Um, and he one of the things he says over and over again is that no one is the worst thing they've done in life. Amen. I I try to believe that, and so then give people the chance to be okay. better. I like that. Thanks, I certainly Julie. don't want to be judged by the worst thing I've done, and I bet nobody in this room does either. And I appreciate that. Reminder from Brian Stevenson, who is certainly a prophet among us mm. and a doer bending the arc mm. uh, more forcefully these days. Um, so to the point of being, hello there. Oh, hi. Sweet child handed me a card. Okay. Okay, oh this is gosh, a question on my book, you're gonna have which to we're not going to talk about in the live in this thing, but I'm going to follow up with you afterwards and answer your question. Okay. All right. Um, so Sean Hannity. So uh, to the point of being able to be in conversation, agreement, compassion doesn't equal agreement, is what you said. You state up front in your book, the United States was founded on hate. You just alluded to that. You put it in the book. Not only is it in the book, it's the start of a new paragraph, and <laughs> it's in all caps. Mm. And I'm the reader, nodding in agreement. But I'm knowing that you're friends with Hannity, and that he even blurbed your book. And it makes me wonder, does Sean Hannity agree with that statement, that the United States was founded on hate, you know, or does he say, no, 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 that wasn't hate, or does he say, yeah, it was hate, but so what, or does he say, yeah, it was hate, and it was awful, and it's behind us? I guess what I'm trying to ask is, when you say America was founded on hate, to people who may not give a damn about what was done to Native Americans and African Americans, Africans who became African Americans, and so on and so forth, when you try to say that to them, to people who really don't care about that, what do they say back to you? People whom I presume don't care, whose narrative doesn't include <laughs> references to those things. What do they say? Um, well, if I've learned anything, it's to not speak for other people. So I'm going to not necessarily, I can't. I can't say exactly what. And, right. and here's the other thing is people aren't a monolith. So there is certainly on the right. And actually, let me just say, I think I just lost my thingy, but there it is. Okay. Um, let me just say, by the way, this is also a view on the left. Right? There are a lot of people on the left who, when confronted with the reality of our history vis-a-vis -vis American Indians, slavery, et cetera, will say, that was the past. Mm -hmm. That was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. That is an attitude on the left and the right. It is more potent, prevalent, and what I think it's, right? So there's certainly, there's, by the way, also a fairly vocal, overt attitude among some, and I think unconsciously among many as well, that some of those moments of history were not unjust, but rather the just spoils of superiority of conquering, right? Yeah. Um, and I disagree. The question is, right, here's the thing. I happen to think people are endlessly complicated. I happen to also think that we are, by and large, a product of 
not only our history, but our society, our education, our culture, our media, our politics. And so the reality is, is I can sit here, and I, as I have believed for decades, and say, look, the way we avoid certain conversations, the way we cut out certain pieces of history, the way we replicate, consciously or unconsciously, in our policies, in our institutions, in our private relationships, the ideology of white supremacy, gives comfort to those attitudes and mindsets. And so I can't say that that is the actual effect and impact of the way we comport ourselves as a society and at the same time say those people are hateful, inherently hateful, deliberately hateful, that's all they are, that's all they'll ever be. Because I am also talking about the structures and inadequacies of our society that produces those mentalities still today. Yeah. You know, you have a beautiful spot in the book where you talk about, uh, I forget the commentator, female commentator on Fox, who you kind of go toe to toe with rhetorically. Scotty Nell Hughes? Yes. And uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know all the Fox people's names because I, I try not to watch Fox. She's a but CNNer, but continue. Um, oh, it's okay. Whoa, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. she's a CNNer. See? Yeah, yeah. All right. So anyway, you're going toe to toe. You're having a conversation about kind of, you know, the. Um, the blacks who are on welfare are lazy, but the whites who are on welfare have come upon hard times. You know, that is how it's possible to characterize one person's suffering as their own damn fault and another person's suffering as the unfortunate result of circumstances out of their control. And then you also allude to the metaphor or the, the allegory or, or the reality of the long line we're all waiting in for opportunity and how white folks, Trumpsters in particular, who are saying, stop cutting in line. You know, they're, they're working class white folks, say, who see immigrants, black folks, Asians, Latinos, everybody they're not, you know, Cutting in line is how they see it. Mm -hmm. What they don't appreciate is how the line was formed in the first place and why they're already in front of all those people. Correct. Right? So this gets to, I mean, you, uh, what I want to ask now is like, so That's what by the way, is Arlie Hochschild's work that okay. I'm so citing there. There we go. Important San Francisco author, but that, that, yeah. that sort of allegory of the line and yes. her metaphor, correct. Thank you for that. So it gets to, you know, I'm trying to get to, what is the opposite of hate, Sally Cohn? <laughs> you know, I know in the book you say like the opposite of hate is connection, but I'm, I feel like it's also education. If we could just educate folks about the line, about the reason it exists and why all these folks are in the back, never had a chance to be up in the middle and we're trying to give them opportunity, isn't, you know, you say on the left, we're not nearly as egregious and our hate is a right. Aren't we kind of saying that, you know, what, if, they, if those folks were only just better educated, they wouldn't be so awful and they wouldn't be so hateful toward us and then we wouldn't have to hate them? First of all, taking the, the sort of piece out of that, again, it's also like, so whose fault is, or whose fault and whose responsibility is education? And if you believe in the government, collective responsibility and collective action that are, right? So, I mean, it's, it's like, again, it's yeah. not, and I'm not like, I'm, I, I'm, I ain't trying to give people a pass here, right? Um, but it's complicated. What I love about Arlie, so this is a, um, a passage that I cite from Arlie Hochschild's book, Strangers in Their Own Land, it's an incredibly important book where she looks at uh, communities in uh, Louisiana that have been in so many ways so specifically harmed by the um, extractive industries and the rollback of policies to fight global warming and who then turned and voted for Trump and what they think and what they see. And it is a deeply humane book mm. because it is like, the thing that's hard to reckon with in that metaphor. And I can tell you, this is from my conversations with Scotty Nell Hughes and from other conservative folks who, by the way, sometimes do and say some things that it is hard to not go, that's, you know, that's overt, that's explicit, you should know better, you should whatever. As a, at, a, at the level of worldview, I w I, and I, I know this is hard, I have come to realize that people do not wake up in the morning intending to be hateful, do not wake up thinking they are hateful, right? Intention isn't the same as impact. It doesn't, you know, that doesn't c clear everyone, right? But you even talk to, I talked to a terrorist interrogator who worked in Afghanistan for the army and she said, look, most people believe their motivation is to be good. Yeah. So that notion of the line, look, we can, where does that come from? That comes from our politicians, that comes from our, Media that comes from our pop culture, 
right? And this notion that like, I'm not against them getting their equality in. You talk to Scott Allen, you talk to the folks, and she'll say, yeah, I feel bad. Yes, I feel bad. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, that history, yeah. And why should I, they think, mm -hmm. why should I have to pay, have for, to pay for it? Mm -hmm. Now, and that is, that is a mentality that is the direct descendant of the rhetoric of Reagan and Nixon and right, and so. And white supremacy. And white supremacy, right? right? But it is not like, that is not inherent in her from birth per se. It is a, it is a contextually created reality. And I think a reality that a lot of, a lot of people right and left, mm. especially white folks, mm. own and identify Right, like uh, uh, one example in the book is Scotty Nell talks about how when uh, she was in college, she her roommate who was black got a scholarship and she didn't. Forgive and she thought that wasn't fair. Triggering. And she, <laughs> Both I know, have been there. Yes. She thought that wasn't fair. Yeah. Now I said because it was her spot. And I said, and I could have, right? I, I said questions are very helpful. I said, well, what if you had it had been a white roommate who got the scholarship? Would you feel? That way, she said, "No, you're right. It's a good point." I, she thought about it. She's like, "I'm not sure. You might have a point." Yeah, I might. Okay, but let me just fa fa here's the other side. You don't have to show of hands, but you can nod knowingly because you've heard this too. I have had liberal friends, well-meaning white liberals, who have said things like, "Well, I probably didn't get that job because they gave it to a black person," mm -hmm. or "I probably didn't get that into that college, or, you know, because they gave the spot to a black person." But I'm I'm good with that. Mm. Right? Mm. But the mm. implicit notion is, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. that all the white people, of whom there are more, yes. who got hired, mm -hmm. who got the, the right, the they were spot. deserving. Mm -hmm. And the only reason the person of color got it was because of right. race and special treatment. It's the same, it's the same message, it's the same ideology. Mm. I don't want to let anyone off the I'm hook. glad you take that on. I have a hard time with white folks talking to me about college admissions. I delight in informing them that the people with the greatest number of beneficiaries of any kind of uh, special uh, consideration are athletes who white are predominantly women. white, not black, legacies who are predominantly white, and rich folks who are predominantly white. Well, and studies show that white women have historically been the greatest beneficiaries of affirmative yeah. action in American yeah. history. I don't think, by the way, that's part of why I wrote the book. I don't think that you should have to have those conversations. That's why I can have those conversations. And this is what it means to be an ally, which is, I think, an important uh, element of combating hate, uh, stepping forward with whatever access you have to whatever groups you have and articulating a message that somebody might be able to hear from you as a white person more easily that they, than they can hear from me as a black person. So let's go to the opposite of hate. You talk about the opposite of hate is connection. You talk about connection speech, connection spaces, connection thinking, connection systems. Walk us through with, I'd love some specific examples, Thanksgiving if you like, but you know, examples of what that looks like in practice. Yeah, so let's go to that specific toolkit for yeah. Thanksgiving. Yeah. In the context of like, look, it's not that simple. I don't think we solve all this individual by individual. Uh, part of what I tried to do was write a book that people could hook into. Yeah. People who don't tend to think about systems and institutions of hate yeah. could hook into and understand through their own individual experiences. So we still need to do something about institutions, systems, policies, practices of hate in our society in w that are infected and inculcated with inequality and injustice. Yeah. Is that a question? And that then affects how we relate to each other, interact with each other, both whether who we know and then the terms on which we do of inequity and injustice, right? So for instance, I do say the opposite of hate isn't love. You don't have to love people to stop hating them. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, you don't even have to like them. What we have to understand is that fundamental connection, that fundamental humanity, dignity that we all share. And what is true, it is not this simple, but what is true is that when, this is a Brene Brown quote, it is harder to hate up close. Mm. And <laughs> what we know is that three quarters of white Americans say they don't have any non-white friends. 53% of Americans say they don't know anyone who's Muslim. Most strong 
Hillary supporters during the election didn't know, a Trump supporter, most strong Trump supporters didn't know any Hillary supporters. We have, our schools are more segregated now than they were 20 years ago, our neighborhoods, our communities are segregated again, that's because of policy, economically segregated, right? Not, but that's because of policy, that's because of history, that's because of, and it's also because of the choices we make, as well as individuals. So um, there is that piece of making an effort to get out of our bubbles, to know each other, to learn. I love the stories in the book of church groups doing programs with mosques where they break bread together and go to each other's worship services and just say, this is wrong, we should know about each other, we should have the relationships so that we can ask the questions so that then when the media pits us against each other, we know better. So this is know about each other as humans as opposed to like, let's break down the Bible and figure out who's right on this passage <laughs> and who's right on this, right? This is, you're talking about no one and discover that we have a whole lot in common that really has nothing to do with this difference that's presently dividing us? Is that what you right. mean? Right, but without it being like reductivist, you know what I mean? Without being like, oh, let's ignore the differences, let's pretend we're all the same, let's kumbaya, let's all come together, let's like, right? This isn't yeah. conciliatory, it's not weak, it's not mushy, it's, it's an and, right? It's I can have my deeply held beliefs, right? I can, I mean, literally, I argue about politics for a reason. I'm not talking about dropping your views or beliefs anytime soon. I can argue firmly and passionately for my beliefs without attacking, demeaning, dehumanizing, and destroying people who disagree with me. So when you have this conversation with somebody, your relative, your uncle, or your aunt, or your whomever, who is really diametrically opposed politically, and you say, you know what, we have a lot that we disagree on, but let's, let's talk about the Niners game, or let's talk about, you know, that book we read, or what have you. Um, is Are you positing that somehow then the person on the other side is less likely to come away? I mean, are they, are they softening their views about you and therefore your political views? Are they less, wh what is the effect of that kindness <sighs> and, and interest in knowing them as a human outside of those beliefs? In th what's the effect in them? Right, well, so l I, I wanna give the specific tool of actually when you wanna have yeah. a political conversation with someone who yeah. whose views you find yeah. um, onerous to say the least, but let me just say, <laughs> to that point, look, first of all, I have a bias in that I don't think hate feels good. Mm -hmm doesn't feel good to me, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't feel good to have hate in my life, in my relationships. Mm -hmm. um, also, to that point that no one is the worst thing they've done in life, I also hope no one is the worst thing they've thought in life, the worst thing they've believed in life. No one also is just who they voted for in 2016 or just who they voted for in 2008. I really hope we are all not just that. Mm -hmm. And there is a way in which our culture, our media, our politics right now, it, it aggravates, incentivizes, profits off of intense division, acrimony, extreme views, and it reduces us to the things we are most divided on. And I don't, and, and that's not, that's not 100% of who people are. Now, so I'm saying if you don't want to engage as a matter of self-preservation and sanity, and because you say, look, I can't do this with my uncle or my friend or whatever, but we're just gonna put, take politics off the table and we're gonna talk about sports, fine. That is a, that is a strategy for sanity and, and safety and self-preservation. If you wanna have the conversation, here's what I've learned. Mm. When we argue, when we sense an argument, the rational thinking, persuasion, uh, thoughtful parts of the brain in the front here, they shut down and the fight or flight part, the little lizard brain, turns on. And when that happens, you pick a side. And your uncle's gonna pick his side, it's always your uncle, your uncle's gonna pick his side and you're gonna pick your side and that's that, and it's over. You're now just rah, 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 rah. Go ahead, if you wanna practice that, that's the formula for how to get into a screaming match, okay? All right. So instead I have a tool uh, that actually comes from Matt Kohut, John Neffinger and Seth Pendleton, Matt Kohut and John Neffinger wrote a book called Compelling People. It is a great book that sort of expands uh, on this. Um, and they're the people who actually trained me on how to go on Fox News and have these conversations. And the trick is ABC. So the A does not stand for argue. Okay. The A stands for affirm. Now again, affirm doesn't mean agree. 
right? But here's the thing, most of us as human beings are, we didn't come to our political views because we kind of assembled a bunch of briefing books and read through them and decided, huh, abortion rights, okay, cool. Right, we have our viewpoints because we feel. We feel that's right, that's wrong, that's, right? And here's the thing about feelings. Feelings are valid because they are felt. So my partner's here, I'm so sorry, honey, but I learned this from couples counseling. <laughs> <laughs> because it turns out, if my partner, Sarah, hi, says that I hurt her feelings, I cannot say, no, I did I not. <laughs> right. Well, you can, but- I can, twice. it ain't gonna work, <laughs> right? Because they're her feelings, yeah. she felt them. Yes. Right? And if I argue with her feelings, I am arguing with her perspective, her worldview, her exit, right? I am, I am, deme I am like attacking her essence, right? Her whole belief and perspective and whatever. I'm undermining her. That's not, she's not going to open her up. She's not going to listen. Feelings are feelings. Let's go, for instance, let's talk about, I, people say I'm worried about terrorism. Now we could talk about the fact that since 9-11, three quarters of mass violent attacks were committed by white right-wing extremists, which, but which the I media, terrorism, but, it right, me. yeah. but the media covers attacks by violent Muslim extremists four times more. Right. So I could sit there and I could say, you know what, you should not be afraid of terrorism, you shouldn't be afraid of Muslim, violent Muslim extremists. I could say how irrational that is and how manipulated that is, and I could say that till the cows come home, but guess what? They, don't they still feel it. Well, they still feel it, yeah. right? Yep. So uh, that's not right. So meeting people, this is an organizing idea. You meet people where they're at. Doesn't mean you have to leave them there. Okay. So you affirm, you find an emotion, okay. right? I get it. I worry about violence too. I worry about my kids being safe. I worry about the economy. I worry about being able to find a job. I worry about losing my job. I worry about my health care. I worry, right? Feeling. Yeah. A. Affirm. B is not but. But, again, learning from couples counseling. But, if I say, uh, honey, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> turns out what that means is, I'm not fucking sorry at all. That's right. <laughs> right? Right? Okay. So, and also you can't say however, which is the Harvard of buts. So like, <laughs> no fancy buts. <laughs> B, B, the ABC, B is bridge. So it's, and that's why, or here's the thing, or the good news is, or even just and. And then C is where you actually say what you came to say. It's convince. You started the convince or the, con or the convey or the whatever your, your content. Right? In the book I say convince. But that's where you, but it's, you, now you're making your point. In a way, it's, mag it's really magical when you do it. In a way that doesn't invalidate the other person's perspective, but actually connects to their perspective. That's what I, in the book I call connection speech. Yeah. And again, try it. Report back, tell me how it works. Mm. It's really powerful. I like this, I like the ABC, I like it's easy to remember. I do have this sort of fluttering heart about A, affirm, because, mm. you know, the notion, the image of the um, house slave comes to mind, or the Uncle Tom, you know, the person whose role is to play nice with them, you know, whose status is elevated uh, in the community because, you know, they denigrate the self in order to be able to, you know, to be what the master wants. Right, that is, it goes back to are we, are we somehow you know, failing to, be, to honor who we are um, in our convictions by affirming the beliefs that they have. I think what you're saying is that there's probably something we can find to affirm, that I don't have to sacrifice my healthy sense of self to affirm what that bigoted white person, you know, feels, <laughs> right? I mean, th this yes. Right? I, I can say, I, I have to search for the common ground that I can affirm, you're saying. Yes, and maybe sometimes you can't find it. And that's, uh, that's okay, I don't, I, that's, you know what, that's a, I, I don't wanna, I wanna let that statement you just made yeah. sit there because that's a very yeah. powerful and important challenge. Yeah, yeah. And I, again, this goes back to compassion isn't the same thing as agreement. Agreement, yeah. And I don't think affirming is the same as agreeing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think you even necessarily are affirming someone's beliefs. You're certainly not affirming the conclusions they've drawn with their feelings. Yeah. You're just, it's even just right. validating that that is where they are. Right. And to be right, you don't have to be wrong. Yeah. For me to be good, you don't have to be bad. Mm. I, I alluded before to the, I don't know if this helps, but I alluded before to the 
moral dimension of this for me and yeah. the sort of moral spiritual piece of it. Yeah. There's also a pragmatic piece, yeah. which is that, again, if I believe in change, I want institutions and policies and structures and systems to change, and I also recognize that one of the ways that happens is when people change and then push for and demand changes in institutions and practices and so forth, that I have yet to see an instance where someone has changed because they were hated into it. Yeah. I have yet to see a moment where someone said, hey, you know those Democrats, they keep calling me stupid and hateful and deplorable. <laughs> I'm gonna go listen to what they're saying. Yeah. That sounds great to me, right? Like it makes yes. people dig in yes. more than maybe they even otherwise yes. would. So okay. from a pragmatic level, that's why I worry about I it. I get you. I wanna turn to audience questions and I want us to try to do them lightning round to get through as many as we can. But first I wanna ask you this, to that point of, you know, is there an equidistant extreme on the left and the right? And whose obligation is it really to try to extend this ABC method to whom? You've been on your book tour for three weeks. What's the percentage of left-like audience moderator conversations versus right-like? How many people on the right are asking you to come talk about this book versus the left? Um, that's a fantastic question. Uh, in fairness, the tour has been fairly left-leaning um, because I don't the know. There's a the there's a right formula. Well, there's a <laughs> formula. I don't even know that. I mean, you can do book tours on the right, I guess. But there's a you know we're we're divided in <laughs> so many states. ways, and it's yeah. like you know I go to the left places and right. <laughs> so there's a little usual suspect to that. I've actually done a lot of right-wing media. Um, and there has been okay. quite, you know, so it's two-ish weeks now, but some a lot of strong interest and more and more people saying, like, look, I wanna, I wanna have this conversation. Do they? And I mean, again, no one's a monolith, right? We all contain multitudes, but I have been, listen, here's what I'll tell you, is, and this is where, like, <laughs> I, I recognize that I can hopefully be constructive in certain spaces, but in a way that is constructive and not self-defeating and not sort of defeating yeah. to larger morals and principles. But when you start a conversation, instead of saying, here's why you're wrong, yeah. here's what you do, mm -hmm. here's what, and start by saying, here's what I do, yeah. here's why I'm wrong, here's why I think yeah. we should stop hating Trump supporters, and here's why I think we should, right? Yeah. It, 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 it allows people to have a very different conversation. Mm -hmm. And dignity and respect. There you go. All right, let's go to some of your fabulous questions. And let I'm just going to, for the sake of. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I no, know. No, I no, could no, don't apologize. No, no. No, no, no. This is not a. You get me off of cable news, and I'm like, let me keep talking. I'm just, what I mean is like, we're all having fun. Lightning I'm round. having fun. Time's flying, and we got a okay, clock. Got it, got it. All right. Um, you have a daughter. You and Sarah have a daughter. And uh, the audience wants to know how do you talk to your daughter and other young people about hate? Is it different from how you discuss hate with adults? Um, I, uh, we've tried to explain systemic to her. I'm not sure. How old is she? Seven. Nine. 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 Okay, that's fine. I'm all, I've been like, honey, gender's a social construct. When she was like six, <laughs> she could repeat it. She didn't know what it meant, but it was okay. really adorable. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, living in a liberal bubble, she would come home during the election and she would say, I hate Trump. And so, or she'd just come home, she'd talk to the school, I hate so-and-so, I hate so-and-so. So one of the things we say, she's nine, so it's age appropriate, is, we don't hate in our family. We don't hate people. We can hate ideas. We can hate things people say, people do, right? But we don't hate people. And then, of course, to try to role model that as well, which is hard, that then we can't come home and say, I hate blah, 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 and I hate, right? That's where the rubber really hits the road. Nice. What do you think the role of social media has been in cultivating or fomenting or fanning the flames of this culture of hate? Uh, friggin' disastrous. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's say. interesting. In the book, I get into some of the ways in which people have used social media yeah. to engage in unbelievably compassionate and transformative people who have left hate movements. Mm -hmm because of the kindness they were shown on Twitter by strangers, mm -hmm. left whole lives of hate behind. So I know it's possible, and yet I am increasingly worried that uh, in terms of the nuance, in terms of the incentive structures for 
cruelty and nastiness that, that social media is still more destructive than constructive in terms of having healthy dialogue and discourse in our country. Mm. What one mutual understanding slash shared view across the aisle do you think could change the world? Or what one belief divides us the most? Oh boy, that's a great question. That's a great question. Gosh. Uh, for a lightning round, let me think. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Solve the world's problems in 30 seconds. I know, that's cool. Um, how about that? I mean, that's actually that's such a great question. Mm -hmm. Like that could be a whole book. Mm -hmm. I I will say this. I am struck that people want good, they want, they want good and they want to do good for, by and large, for themselves, for their communities, and for their families. Mm -hmm. I actually, like, that is a real... Universal. That is a fairly universal connection. Mm -hmm. um, and I will also say that there are so many issues that feel intractable. What is interesting is when you get out of the heat yeah. of social media or cable news or Thanksgiving and, and are willing to be honest in a, a sort of vulnerable way, what's interesting is how much people can seed ground. Yeah, okay, I'm not just like, I don't wanna take away all the guns. And you know, yeah, okay, I get, we do have a problem with school shootings and right, and, and really struggle through the middle space away from the two extremes. Mm. Um, it doesn't mean that it's perfect alignment, but that the reality, I think, of what we all believe, honestly, is often more nuanced. Mm -hmm. But we feel like we have to sort of, they said that, so we have to say this, mm -hmm. and that, right? And, and we can't, uh, that nuance is weakness. Yeah. Um, and that concerns me. I think the belief that divides us the most is the extent to which we have decided that there are some human beings who are not really human beings. You know, I don't think you can see someone get shot in the back by a police officer and decide it's okay, unless you think that person isn't really a human, it's more like a dog or a wild animal. That dehumanization of queer folk, black folk, brown folk, et cetera. To me, it, the question, you know, if I was yeah, up here I answering that. the question, which I guess I am, yeah. um, you know, I think that is one of the most divisive, hurtful elements in our current moment, that we actually, because if we could see those folks as human beings, we would weep in anguish over what is happening, for example, in the context of black lives. Okay, can I, can I make a provocative statement, though? <laughs> yes. Again, first of all, I, I'm not sure if you're saying that's an overt versus an unconscious belief. I think it is an unconscious belief, wi a widely broad, but I, I would think, I would posit that we would not have the crisis around, for instance, police brutality, mass incarceration, uh, state violence against brown and black folks, if that view were not also held on the left. So I would not say it's a view that divides the right and left in that sense at all. Okay, point taken. It's everywhere. Um, let's do this. We have 13 minutes left. I wanna be respectful of the time. And I was struck in, and there's so many questions and, I'm, and I, I don't wanna get to them all. Um, um, I was struck in the book at how personal you got. You speak, you bookend the book mm. with Vicki Rarsh. Uh, not her real name. Not her real name, a classmate whom you acknowledge, you bullied. And then the book ends with your attempt to seek her out and make amends. And in some ways you've really brought your, your very personal self and you've illuminated the fact that we all hate by sharing some of the moments you're less proud of. Um, so I want to turn to um, our present moment, which is your book tour, and um, where there's a controversy um, afoot. Um, some prominent black women have um, grown quite concerned about the way in which they're quoted in your book. Aminatou Sal, so, Aminatou. So, yes, Aminatou Sal. So. Aminatou Sal, so, um, Ijeoma, Olu Oluo, Oluo um, have both taken issue with how you've quoted them. And um, I, I know some in the audience are aware of this. I've got some questions about that. I intended it to, to raise it myself. Um, why don't you tell us where you are in that uh, conversation and that controversy? 
first of all, I'm grateful to have the chance to address it um, because it is an important conversation. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, one of the challenges as we were alluding to is these are hard conversations to have in general and especially hard conversations to have in the swirl of the internet and social media where often nuance and, and fact and so forth get mixed with accusations and so forth. And so here's what is true, is that as a white woman, I did not think about how the quote that I had from Amina uh, played into racial stereotypes and potentially exposed her to vulnerability. That was my mistake, that was my blind spot. That was my privilege, that was my, and if I had, I would have reconfirmed that she was okay with me using her quote. I regret that I didn't, I've apologized, I'll continue to apologize. Similarly, as a white woman, I did not think about how I was pitting Amina and Ijeoma's ideas and perspectives against them. Mm. I, I did not. Now, listen, I could talk as long as I, you know, forever about intent and my intent and, and intent is not what matters as much as impact. Mm -hmm. So for me, look, it, it's always hard to learn lessons and it's especially hard to learn lessons in public. Mm -hmm. What I hope we can do, the only way any of us get better, and I know the only way I get better, is by learning and growing and trying to do better. Mm -hmm. And that means I hope that we can have conversations in which we challenge each other, hopefully challenge each other with kindness and compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's important to our democracy and to healing these patterns, these history, this history, these habits that we have. And that I am certainly guilty of. Mm. And that's gonna, you know, for me, it's gonna be, uh, it's, it's an on, that's it is an ongoing project. It is ongoing. You know, I believe in all of us as humans. It's one of my central tenets um, as a person who works with people. I believe in all of us and I feel that we're all works in progress or we should be that we shouldn't sort of decide we are educated, we have made it, we have arrived at the place we'd always hoped we'd be and now we can just coast. Mm. And so as I watch at a distance, um, not personally friendly with any of you, I watch this on Twitter, I watch what's happening in the news, um, I really find myself feeling compassion for all of you. Um, you know, the dynamic at work um, that Amina and Ijeoma are concerned about has to do deeply with being black and female in America, but not just black. There's a light skin, dark skin mm -hmm. um, reality going on that those of us, and I speak here for those who can't see me as a light skin black woman, you know, knowing that I have a, a whole lot of privilege uh, for being light skin that my darker skinned brothers and sisters don't have. And so it strikes me that what's happened here is you have unwittingly, um, really press some buttons. I say unwittingly because I don't think you intended to hurt anybody. Um, um, but it sounds like you did. And um, so with the lessons of the opposite of hate, I've, I've heard you talk about, I've apologized and you know, I have a lot to learn and so on. I'd like to push deeper and say, so what, what is the learning? How can what you have experienced and what you are currently experiencing, um, how can you sh um, allow that learning to be something we can all learn from? What is it that you would do differently next time? What is it that you would advise anybody trying to bring other people's arguments in, a book to support your own? What would you advise by way of blind spots, by way of assumptions and privileges yeah. based on what you've learned in this moment? Um, I mean, I, I can only answer honestly, which is that I am still working through that. I am still working through, you know, this is uh, still rather recent for me, so I am still learning as I have, you know, there's a reason, by the way, I called it the opposite of hate, not like the destination, right? It is, we are works in progress, and I certainly 
and a work in progress. Um, so I, I, in, in all honesty, that is something I'm still figuring out. Obviously, it has made me more aware of those blind spots, the power and privilege that I have, how I, even when I think, my, as I said, even my intention is what I think to be good, that it may not be the impact, and to get more reality checks, right? That I still can't just rely on me to get more reality checks and perspective and to put myself into situations where I can be more readily challenged to grow and learn. It, to me, goes back to, it's not dissimilar to what we were talking about with uh, engaging others who we disagree with in, a, in more obvious ways on the other you know, far end of the aisle and whatnot, which is that to hopefully learn going forward and to continue hopefully to model going forward, to open oneself up earnestly and authentically to criticism because that is how we learn. That is how we grow. The definition of a blind spot is there's something you do not see, so hopefully you learn to see better. Mm. Um, but again, I, it, it's, it's, you know, this is going to, for me, it is going to be a, I think, a very long, if not a lifelong process. I, I, yeah, I'm going to keep learning, tripping over uh, those things and keep, and all I can do is continue to try to take responsibility for the mistakes I made. Mm. Try to learn and do better. Mm. Let's go to Vicki Varsh. Summarize for the audience what went down in elementary school and then what you tried to do at the end. <sighs> because I think yeah, there's these are not unrelated. No, um, uh, so uh, I was a uh, I was a bully in fifth grade. It's funny, my uh, eighth grade English teacher came to a book event a few nights ago. She's like, "You weren't a bully." I was like, "No, no, no." <laughs> Figured it out by then. I stopped. Mm. Um, and then switched schools, it was great. So I could have like a whole Fresh new, start. yeah. Um, then I went to just the weird nerdy outsider kid, mm -hmm. but that was sort of a much better choice. Um, you know, when I was in elementary school, I picked on other kids. There's no two which ways about it. And the most sort of potent memory for me was uh, having been quite mean to a uh, this kid who I call Vicky, who it was very plain, looking back, had a lot of emotional, physical, economic needs that the me I like to think I am would have helped, mm -hmm. and instead I hurt. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I want to be clear, when I talk in the book about hate, I use a broad definition of hate. Yeah. Right? And by the way, it's not about like you hate broccoli or you hate your ex-boyfriend. No. I don't care about that. It's just about, but it's about our history and habits mm -hmm. of demeaning and dehumanizing certain people, especially certain groups of people because of their ideas mm -hmm. and their identity. Mm -hmm. And I do not think bullying is the same thing as, you know, genocide and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. That, you know, yeah. me being a bully is not the same thing as the neo-Nazis and the yeah. terrorists I talk to in the book. At the same time, they have the same root. Mm -hmm. It is not an accident. Mm -hmm. It's not a coincidence that the kid I picked on was poor and ended up being gay. Poor kids and gay kids are more likely to be bullied in school, as are uh, gender nonconforming kids in general, as are kids of color, as are kids with disabilities, the same communities of people we discriminated against in our policies, right. in our institutions and society as a whole. That's the common root. Mm -hmm. Now, what is also appropriate, uh, apropos of this other conversation we're having is, um, in the end, I found her. And I you apologized. You I did. I, I, I had to find her. You had to go find her. Um, she changed her name. She changed her name several times. It was hard to find her um, uh, for a whole set of reasons that I, I, I don't, you know, I, I trust have to do with a hard life. Um, and I apologized. I needed to apologize. Yes. My apology is independent of, and not de not deserving nor entitling of forgiveness. Right? I don't deserve her, and she did not forgive me. And that is okay. Mm. Part of, and I mean, it is a way in which the book ends with discomfort. Yeah. And I also think that's okay, because yeah. we need to get to the place, I think, as a country and with each other, where we can be okay with the discomfort that through which learning and growth and change is the result. 
as you describe yourself driving through the streets of whatever town Vicky Rarsh now lived in, you really slow down the narrative and really mm. take us there in the car with you, I felt. Mm. And I found myself wondering, Sally, are you thinking about what it might be like for, Vic for Vicky Rarsh to open the door and see you? Or is this all about your need to apologize? Exactly. That's why I didn't knock on her door. Yeah. It, I wasn't. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. And thank you for noticing that. And I wasn't. I was thinking about my own uh, need to apologize, my own need, not even for forgiveness per se, although of course I wanted it, but a sense of sort of absolution that I hadn't ruined her life, that yeah. she was okay, that yeah. right? And I had not, yeah. I had not yeah. thought about that mm. until I was parked outside of her house and realized, mm. oh, mm. like it, then it, then yeah. it hit me and I'm grateful that it did. And I ended up writing her a letter and, and that's how we uh, had the exchange. My sense is that there may be lessons from that moment that are relevant to the present moment. Yeah. And I believe in humans, and I believe in all of us. And I think the only way through is forward. You know, um, Julie, that is a profound point. That is a profound point. There are moments where you are come face to face with, you know, we, we, we move through the world looking through our own eyes, mm -hmm. circumscribed by our own experience, knowledge, intentions, history, beliefs, perspectives. And part of why I think it is so important to connect across our different differences and divides is because it gives us opportunities to be exposed to and challenged about what maybe blind spots even here is the wrong word, but what are in fact our blinders, our limitations of our own perspectives. And even then, it to continue to for it to continually keep happening and to be okay with going through that. Absolutely. And I'm someone who's gone through stuff in life, everyone in the audience has, uh, for the sake of all parties concerned. I hope that um, conversations are had and people are heard and understood and ultimately that everyone can move forward. Um, with that, I turn to the final question that I think I'm supposed oh, to ask you. I was warned about this. And did the, I uh, think about it? No, yeah, I no, didn't. No, you didn't think about it. All right, I got okay, it. Are you ready? All right, yeah, sure, like, here we go. Like, this is the Sorry. informed tradition to ask all of our speakers the following question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? <laughs> all right, a little last hit of caffeine. Um, you know, again, I try to get into what I, I, th I do think it's important that we think about policies and structures and systems. And I will, and I will say my takeaway, my sort of mantra, what I offer, you do you, here's what I offer as my takeaway here, which is if we all have that sort of they started it philosophy of hate, so then we feel our hate is justified in reaction to their hate, and by the way, they do the same thing about us, and so hate becomes hate, feeds, feeds, hate, feeds, hate, feeds, hate, and we just hate. never, we just hate, we just keep hating, ad infinitum forever. That what I have realized, and what I, I think would be constructive, a piece of the puzzle, is that I don't want to be the excuse for someone else's hate. I don't want to be the excuse for someone else's hate. I'm going to try, try, to be the inspiration for someone else's better behavior. Let me even put that differently, which is I don't, since we talked about no one is just the worst thing they've done in life, I don't want to be the excuse for others to be their worst selves. I want to be the inspiration, I hope, for others to be their best selves. That, that I can control. 
Let's leave it at that. It's a beautiful ending. Let's give a huge round of applause to Sally Kong. <laughs> Sally, thank you for joining us here at Inforum at the Commonwealth Sally. Club. Copies of her book, The Opposite of Hate, are on sale, and she'll be signing copies out in a lounge shortly. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank and you, have everyone. A great evening. Everyone, thank Julie, you, a round of applause. Unbelievable. Thank you. And to the little boy in the audience who gave me this, I'll talk to you about my book afterwards. <laughs> All right.